Let us, beloved, let us pray before the word of God comes into light. Father God, we thank you for your word that does not come to you void, but accomplishes its purpose. Oh, Father, it is by your grace and your mercy that we have come here today. Father God, we ask that you take absolute control of whatever we are coming to do. You take absolute control so that at the end of everything, we will have cause to glorify your holy name. And Father God, we ask that your calling on us will be yes in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Beloved, the title of the message today is The Significance of the Upper Room. The Significance of the Upper Room. The Upper Room is a place of fellowship and reunion. And we can read about that in Acts 1, verse 12 to 14, and Acts 2, verse 1. The upper room is a place of spiritual impartation and gift. Acts 2, verse 14. The believers stay together in the upper room where they collectively prayed and made supplication. Essentially, this will be the first church service. At the time that this memorable prayer was altered, Jesus was in what is known as the upper room. Around him was a group of men who had pledged to themselves his discipleship. The weight of the cross was upon him. It must have been a sorrowful gathering. Jesus Christ knew what the cross was. He knew what Calvary was. And he knew he was destined, what he was destined for. Humanly, it must have been a daunting experience. He pointed to the fact that all of them were not clean. He said one of them would betray him. He might have been sorrowful as he had called them his friends. Beloved, this is a lesson to us all. If anybody will come into your life and torment you, it is people that you are close with, your family members. So Jesus knew at this point that the one who was going to betray him was close to him. And at the time that he was about to introduce to them what is known as the Last Supper. He said, one of you will betray me. He brought them into the deeper side of his friendship. And yet, there were those among them who were weak. There were those among them who were fickle. There were those among them who were inclined to desertion. But none of them had the slightest idea who would betray our Lord. And when Jesus identified the betrayer proverbially, they did not understand him. Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, had no inclination of repentance upon identity and still went ahead to do what he intended to do. Beloved, I feel in my spirit that Jesus was talking and praying 
with his disciples for that lengthy time to give Judas a chance of repentance. But Judas made no such thing as repentance. He even went out there and betrayed our Lord with a kiss and took 30 pieces of silver. God does not impose salvation on us. He rather give us the chance to do so ourselves. Jesus then went ahead and watched the disciples' feet. And when Peter objected, Jesus said, unless I wash you, your feet, you have no part with me. When the twilight of his life was drawing to a close, and at the tender age of 33, he said, Father, glorify me. He also requested his father to glorify him so that he may also glorify those whom he had given him. He asked the father to keep them from the evil one and to sanctify them by the truth, which is his word. He applies this same prayer to believers in all ages saying, I do not ask for this only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Father, I recognize the fact that the hour has come, glorify those through me and make them one. If Christians need a prayer of togetherness, this is the time, a time when our Lord Jesus Christ is calling us believers to a time of prayer and unity. We need to pray for all and sundry. We need to pray for the betrayer. We need to pray for the deserter. We need to pray for the man who denied Jesus under pressure. He is praying the same prayer for me and you every day, calling us for oneness of purpose, calling us for oneness of mind, and calling us for oneness of the spirit. Beloved, we see from this message that Jesus Christ prayed a three-part prayer. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples. And he prayed for the disciples to come. Many of the events of the upper room echo down to us today. We live under the new covenant instituted at the time. We observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of that night. And we can read about that. It is important to read about this from 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 26, and we live under the blessing of his prayer for all those who love and follow him. The early apostles and believers paid dearly for their faith in Jesus Christ. There were those who under pressure refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, which is the resurrection, yes. Others braved abuse and whips, and yes, chains and dungeons. There are stories of those who were stoned 
sawed into two, murdered in cold blood. Stories of fragrant wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless, making their way as best they could on the cruel edges of the world for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beloved, what sacrifices have you made in life for the sake of the gospel? This is a question to ask all. This is a question for all of us. What sacrifices have you made for the sake of the gospel? I leave you to ponder over this, this new year. May the precious blood of Jesus Christ speak on our behalf. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved, let us bow our heads whilst I pray to conclude the message. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father God, touch our hearts through this and let us ponder over it as we go our separate ways. Let us remember the, re the death of Jesus Christ and take it upon ourselves to emulate what the Lord did through the shed blood of Calvary. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen.